We welcome you to this, the first of our studies in Nehemiah, a series we've entitled A Night in Nehemiah. And tonight as we begin, we're going to re rehash all the things that we've been learning from the first chapter as a church. We have already conducted two studies in this book. And so if you're just joining with us tonight, we're just going to recover all the ground that we've already uh, uh, spent time in. And we're praying that the Lord will continue to teach us. And then God willing, tomorrow evening, we'll launch out into chapter 2. But let's turn in our Bibles this evening to Nehemiah in the chapter 1. And let's read together the first 11 verses, please. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, And it came to pass in the month Chislu in the 20th year, as I was in Shushan the palace, that Hananiah, one of my brethren, came. He and certain men of Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left of the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said unto me, The remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. It came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and wept, and mourned certain days, and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. And I said, I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God, that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments. Let thine ear now be attentive and thine eyes open, that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant, which I pray before thee now, uh, today and night, for the children of Israel, thy servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against thee. Both I and my father's house have sinned. We have dealt very corruptly against thee, and have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the judgments which thou commandest thy servant Moses. Remember, I beseech thee the word that thou commandest thy servant Moses, saying, If ye transgress, I will scatter you abroad among the nations. But if ye turn unto me, and keep my commandments, and do them, though they were of you cast out unto the uttermost part of the heaven, yet will I gather them from thence, and will bring them unto the place that I have chosen to set my name there. Now these are thy servants and thy people, whom thou hast redeemed by thy great power and by thy strong hand. O Lord, I beseech thee, let now thine ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant and to the prayer of thy servants who desire to fear thy name. And prosper, I pray thee, thy servant this day, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. For I was the king's cupbearer. Amen. And we know the Lord will bless his word to our hearts once again. As we continue our thoughts in this book, we're recovering the ground that we've already thought about in the chapter 1. And the book of Nehemiah brings us into a time period in the life of the nation of Judah whenever they are in captivity. The Babylonian army has come into their land and ravished it. They've now marched up to the very walls and gates of the city of Jerusalem. They've ransacked that city and they've taken the people captive. A period of 70 years has elapsed from the days of the prophecy and the ministry of Jeremiah. And now the people in captivity know what it is to be under the oppression of the Persian Empire. But the re relaxation even of the king there has allowed a return of the people to occur. Zerubbabel left, or led the first return. That was even a group of people who went with the intent of rebuilding the temple. Ezra led the second return. And his desire was to see uh, a restoration of the true worship, the temple worship of God among the people there in the city of Jerusalem. And so we come to the days of Nehemiah and we're about on the threshold of this third return. But if we took a spiritual x-ray into the life of the nation of Judah at that time, the spiritual condition of those lives, we would see a people who have little time for the word of God, little interest in the things of God. Indeed, a people that we could rightly say are about to give up. Throughout this book of Nehemiah, we will see three reoccurring themes. They all center on the individual Nehemiah himself. We'll see that Nehemiah was one who had a high regard for the word and for the will of God. We'll see that Nehemiah was one who was willing to obey God, even when it was not easy, nor indeed popular to do so. We'll see that Nehemiah being engaged in a work for God faced opposition sadly from within and from without. And these are three great lessons that you and I can apply to our lives and to our hearts as we go forward. We can be people who have a high regard for the word and for the will of God. We can be people who are willing to follow God no matter how unpopular it may be, no matter how hard it may be. We are people then who are prepared 
in doing a work for God to face the opposition that sadly comes from within but also no doubt from without. And so we learn these lessons. We look for these lessons and we continue our thoughts together. But we want to consider first of all in this first chapter the man Nehemiah. It's his name of course by which this book is called and this records for us a little snapshot into the life of Nehemiah. Nothing really is given about his background save his father's name and of course his brother's name also. But nevertheless, Nehemiah is a man who leaves his mark in scripture. He may not be found in any other part of scripture nor indeed referenced by any New Testament writer. But nevertheless, he leaves an indelible mark upon these pages of scripture before us testifying of one who did something in his generation to the praise and to the glory of God. He was a man plucked from seeming uh, obscurity, but nevertheless he had the hand of God upon him. He was a man who was sensitive to the call of God and to the leading of God and was willing to follow therein. I know that we would be such people today. People that despite having perhaps nothing of significance in our lives and our background, nevertheless know what it is to have the hand of God upon us. And to be people who are willing then to follow the leading of God. Nehemiah is employed as a cupbearer for the king of Persia. He stands before the king day by day and he tastes of that wine and eats of that food that is to be served to the king in order to ensure that nothing untoward was found therein. But Nehemiah is also displayed in this book as not only a cupbearer but then a builder and subsequently then a governor. But what really marks the life of Nehemiah is nothing to do with the rules that he holds within this book. Rather, it's all about his character. For here is a man who receives a report about the people of Judah who have returned from exile to the land of Judah, who have returned to that city of Jerusalem, that city which was the city of God, something that was very important to the Jewish people of his day. And he is a man who is stirred to action because of the reports that he hears. And Nehemiah makes a difference for the future generations to come. Why? Because he was willing to do something in the days in which he lived. He was willing to change the future by doing something then. We need people like that today. People who are willing to secure a future for our children and for our grandchildren. Who are willing to do what is necessary in these times to win souls to Christ. To build churches up and to see the gospel message go forth. Oh that we were Nehemiahs. Oh that there were to be found Nehemiahs in our land today. People who are willing to follow God. But I want to notice some things about Nehemiah that are told to us here in this first chapter. For as Nehemiah hears this report, he stirred to action and note the action that he takes. In verse 4 of the chapter, it records for us that after hearing this report, that he sat down and he wept. This report moved him to tears. It burdened his heart. It broke him because of all that he heard. And not only did he weep, but the Bible tells us that he mourned certain days. And so it wasn't emotion that was driving him to tears. Rather, it was that burden, it was that brokenness of the heart. I wonder today, are you burdened? Are you broken by what's unfolding in our land? Are you burdened? Are you broken for the needs that exist within our days, within our locality? Are you broken and moved to tears for the lives of men and women who are outside of Christ or who know nothing of experiencing and living out the true joy of Christ in their lives. And as God looks upon us tonight, where are the tears for those who are lost and perishing in their sin? For those who know nothing of the true joy of knowing Jesus Christ as their Saviour. He wept, he mourned, he fasted. You may have a differing opinion of fasting than I do, but I believe fasting to be something of importance in the life of a believer. For fasting sharpens our focus, it sharpens our mind, and it helps us truly to centre in on that which is important. And as we come to prayer, it enables us then to truly know what it is to focus without distraction on the burdens of our heart. 
Therefore, I would encourage each and every believer to practice as they're able physically to do so a regular time of fasting in their lives in order that they might devote that time in focused prayer and worship to God. Nehemiah wept, Nehemiah mourned, Nehemiah fasted, but Nehemiah prayed. And it was this prayer, it was his ability in prayer that truly set him apart from everybody else. There's no other recorded prayer meetings in this whole uh, book. Oh yes, there's times of prayer, but there's no corporate gatherings of God's people coming together identified. And therefore, this book helps me to understand that despite the opinion of many today who say that we need to have many prayer meetings, this is not the real need of the hour. For we do not need more meetings for meetings' sake. Rather, you and I need to know what it is to truly pray. Nehemiah was a man who got through to God. Nehemiah was a man who knew what it was to do business with God. And therefore, I tell you today, we do not need more prayer meetings. We need to pray. Notice how he prayed. The Bible tells us in verse 5 that as he prays, he said, I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God, that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments. He entered into God's presence with reverence. That attitude of true worship, he understood and recognised the one to whom he came. And so I encourage you, as you come to prayer, do not rush into God's presence. Rather, take that time to be deliberate in prayer, ascribing glory, honour and praise to the one before whom you bow. The Bible also tells us in verse 6 that he says, Let thine ear now be attentive and thine eyes open, that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant, which I pray before thee now, day and night, for the children of Israel. Here was someone who had authority in prayer. He went before God with great boldness. If we could paraphrase all that Nehemiah is saying in this moment, he is simply asking of God, is his ears open? Is his eyes open? Is he seeing and beholding the circumstances of the children of Israel and the days in which Nehemiah lives? Oh, if we were to hear such prayer today, we would no doubt scoff, mock, perhaps be shocked at it. But Nehemiah prayed with authority. He got a hold of God. Not only did he pray with respect, not only did he pray with authority, but he prayed with confession. We're going on in verse 6. He says, I confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against thee. Both I and my father's house have sinned. We have dealt very corruptly against thee and have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the judgments, which thou commandest thy servant Moses. He was real about the sin in his own life. He was real about the sin in his own nation. And he came before the Lord and he confessed all that the Lord already knew. You and I do well to learn that lesson. Sometimes I'm an expert. You're an expert of ignoring that which is right in front of us. When I preached this message several weeks ago, to our own people as we began this study, but I am no less convicted now. I mourn the sins that separate me from that too close fellowship with God. I mourn my besetting sins. I know that God would forgive me. Oh, that God would forgive our nation. And in a time when surely God is speaking very clearly to your heart and to my heart, May we be willing to confess our sins, knowing that he is faithful. He is just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He prayed with reverence. He prayed with authority. He prayed with confession. But he prayed with boldness. 
Remember, I beseech thee, the word that thou commandest thy servant Moses, saying, If ye scatter, uh, I will scatter you abroad among the nations. But if ye turn unto me and keep my commandments and do them, though they were of you cast out unto the uttermost part of heaven, yet I will gather them from thence and will bring them unto the place which I have chosen to set my name there. Were they a people who deserved this? No. But God had promised. In Deuteronomy chapter 4 and chapter 30, he had rehearsed this promise to Moses. And so Nehemiah comes with boldness before the Lord. And he says, you've promised it in the past. Now fulfill it in the present. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace. That we may obtain help in the time of need. Friends, we need to come before the Lord with boldness. Let us come before him and claim the promises given in his word. Perhaps there's something in your life that you feel that God has promised to you, the salvation of a lost family member or loved one, a reviving of the spiritual condition of our land. Let us come and claim that which God has given. Let us come and re rehearse to him his word as he's given it to us. Let us come and lay claim to all that is promised therein. He also prayed continually. The Bible tells us in verse 6 that Nehemiah himself confessed that I pray before thee now, day and night. And then by doing a simple comparison of the month Chesley and then the month Nisan, it's mentioned in the verse 1 of chapter 2, we can see that a period of four months elapses between the beginnings of Nehemiah's prayer life and the results that came from it. And so as we come to prayer, let us be a people who continue in prayer, seeking from God great things, but willing even to continually come before his face, consistently asking for those things that we have great need of. And so you have the man Nehemiah. But notice also the motive of the man. What was that burden that was upon Nehemiah's heart? Why was it so real? Why was it so personal to him? I believe that his burden was for the people. Because ministry is all about people. As Hananiah and his brethren came back from the city of Jerusalem, the question that Nehemiah asked is given to us in verse 2. I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped and which were left of the captivity and concerning Jerusalem. And they answered and said unto me, The remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. And upon hearing that news, Nehemiah wept, Nehemiah mourned, Nehemiah fasted, and Nehemiah prayed. Why? Because his heart was burdened for the people. They were in great affliction. They knew times of great need. They were in great reproach. That meant that they faced opposition. They were under a real burden. Nehemiah prayed. All because the people's needs motivated him to do so. Can I ask who you're praying for? Who is that soul that God has placed upon your heart? Who are those people that God has placed upon your heart to pray for their salvation, to pray that he will in mercy redeem them, to pray that in their lives they will be built up in their most holy faith, to pray that they'll be led on with God and led to higher service for God? Who are the people that God is burdening your heart with? Everyone needs a person, someone to pour their own life into someone to be that burden of prayer for who is the people who is the person that God is asking you to pray for not only did you have the man Nehemiah and the motive of the man but notice also the message behind the motive for as his concern was first and foremost for the people then the message comes about the condition of the city and it tells us there, the wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, verse 3, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. 
And here was painted a great picture of devastation in a city, a physical location. But that picture that was painted was reflective of the condition of the hearts of the people. They had no spiritual protection. They had no gates upon their walls. There was nothing that kept the enemy out. There were people bowed down with care. Walls in Scripture have a very specific purpose. God has given them for the protection of his people. Walls also speak of that place of communion between God and an individual, that place of prayer, or simply that place to get away from it all, to be quiet, to rest peacefully in the knowledge and the presence of God. I wonder how are the walls of your life? That which God has given you for protection, his word, prayer, the preaching of his word, the breaking of bread with other believers. Have you followed the Lord in baptism? Are you part of a local fellowship? All these things God has given to us in his word that we might be protected from the enemy. Hear these words of Charles Swindle. He says, quite frankly, I think the walls of our lives often lie in ruins through neglect. So as you look at your life tonight, as your walls, are they well built up? Are they neglected? He goes on to say, the leader who brings us to rebuild the walls is the Holy Spirit. And it is he who continues the work of reconstruction inside us. He tries his best to bring to our attention the condition of our walls. But sometimes we don't hear what he is saying. We are not hard of hearing. We simply don't listen. Some of you are living within the walls of your life, surrounded by ruin. And it all began very slowly. First there was a loose piece of stone or mortar. Then there was a crack that appeared in the wall. And then it broke into pieces. And there was a hole. Because of further neglect, the weeds of carnality began to grow through the wall. And by and by, the enemy gained free access to your life. You may be known as a solid Christian man or woman, but you know in your heart that although you are a Christian in the same sense that Jerusalem belonged to the Jews, so too the wall around your spiritual life that protects and defends you is in shambles. Such things as selfishness, lack of discipline, procrastination, immorality, not making time for God, compromise and rebellion, they've all come and sowed their ugly seeds and now they've begun to bear their poisonous fruit. Is that true about your life? Then rebuild the wall. No longer may the wall of your life be neglected, but rather may you maintain it, may you work at it, may you do that which is necessary to ensure it's in the very best of condition so that the protection is there, so that the place of communion with God is there. So that you know and acknowledge the presence of God in your life. But what about the gates? The gates were non-existent in Jerusalem in the report of Hananiah. The gates were that which were able to be closed to keep the enemy out. They were able then to be open to allow the good to come and to go from that city. I believe that the gates speak very clearly even to the five senses of our body. Our eye gate, our ear gate, our nose, our taste and our touch. Perhaps tonight your eyes have feasted upon that which is not good, not wholesome. And through your eye gate has entered into your mind and entered into your heart that which seeds or plants the seed of corruption. Maybe it's a movie. Maybe it's a TV show. Maybe it's something on the internet. But it's entered through your eye gate. Perhaps your ear gate. The music of the world. Perhaps it's gossip or slander that you've entertained and listened to. And all through it, you're planting those seeds and allowing those seeds of corruption to be planted in your heart. Perhaps it's your hands instead of being employed and wholesome things and things in service for God, you've allowed your hands to be engaged in the work of the enemy. You've typed a message 
You've typed an email. You've been busy to and fro in the affairs of this world, mixing it up instead of putting your hands together and praying. Perhaps it's your tongue. You've tasted of the things of this world and you lust after them, fame, popularity, fortune. Perhaps your tongue has been used for slander or for gossip instead of praise and prayer. And tonight the gates of your life are non-existent. Entering into your life is all sorts of wickedness and carnality. Will you repair the gate? Will you rebuild the wall? Will you protect your heart? Remember the word of God tells us that out of the heart proceedeth all the issues of life. But we need a wall. We need our gates. All to be in good condition. All to be working at their very optimal way. Tonight as we end, survey your life. Will you be a man or a woman like Nehemiah? Someone who is broken and burdened for the needs that are existing in our land, in our world, perhaps even in your own family, in your own community. Will you be a person of prayer? Will you be someone who builds and rebuilds the walls of your life and hangs again the gates of your life in an appropriate and proper way to ensure that the heart, the heart is kept, the heart is guarded. We end as we have always done in our studies thus far with the words of the Reverend Samuel Chadwick who preached a sermon on Nehemiah and then ended up with these words, O Lord, make us intensely spiritual. Keep us perfectly natural and thoroughly practical. Lord, make us intensely spiritual. Keep us perfectly natural and thoroughly practical. May God bless his word to our hearts. And we pray that the Lord will continue to feed us from his word as we continue these studies together. God bless.